Romans chapter 5, verse 17. It's only proper to greet you as saints. Saints of God, those of the Most High. And He is King, and so are you. In your own measure. You're kings and priests. Mm -hmm. And I've heard a lot about the priesthood of us that we have in intercession, but I've seen ever more clearly as of recent that we are not only priests, but we are kings. That we right now, we have a sense of authority and a sense of reign that has already begun because of Christ. There is a text in Revelation I want to give to you. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. It says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation that hast made I like that word, made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you consider God's grace, you always consider that word, made. He has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, it's my contention, brethren, grace goes beyond the covering of a blanket for just sins of the past, and that's a wonderful truth about grace, is that it covers sin. But grace does more than just cover past mistakes. Amen. Grace helps you to make less mistakes. Amen. And that's the way the grace of God is. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 17, you'll read of two men in this text who impacted the human race. One was called the first man. Thank God he was the first. <laughs> and not the second or the last. But the first man, his name was Adam. The second man, his name is Christ. Both are mentioned in this text. Both had an impact upon the race. Both are men. <laughs> Both were unusually born of God. Adam was molded from the, from the earth. And Jesus came in a special way. Both are what we call progenitors of the human race, which means they, they were like fathers, you might say. Even in genetics today, you see this kind of thing where you have a man and a woman, and through their genes come their children, and then after them, the genes come from, from the father. And uh, that's what Adam and Christ are both like. Adam is a physical man. Christ is a spiritual man. Both of them received a commandment, and here's where things change. Adam received a commandment, as you may recall, in the garden. He was told that he could eat of every tree that was in that garden except for one. And he broke it. Thank God Jesus didn't break his. Amen. He didn't break his. But as a result of Adam's transgression, humanity went downhill. Now when God made humanity, as you may recall, he said, let us make man in our image. So we're made in the likeness of God. And he tells us what that really meant right there in that text. And it says, let him have dominion. Dominion. <coughs> so we put it in our hearts. And he shaped our natures to have dominion. You may recall Adam named all the animals and these kind of things. And sin, so to speak, wiped that away. The very domain in which we were made to reign and rule. And to have our wills being shaped by the things that we wanted to do. We now became slaves. We now became slaves in the very domain that we were, we were made to reign. How well it is put in Isaiah 59, 9 through 12. Concerning our condition because of Adam's transgression. Therefore is judgment far from us. Neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee. Our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them. Because of sin's entrance into the world, we went from honor to dishonor. We went from glory to shame. We went from strength to weakness. We went from ability to inability. We went from life to death. We went from very good to condemned. Mm -hmm. We went from king to slave. And above all things, 
The hardest thing we went from fellowship to God to being alien. Now, even today, we taste of these things of Adam. As you may all well know recently, of weaknesses in times of hardship and struggles. And that's all due to Adam. All of your hardships are due to Adam. All of your weaknesses are due to Adam. Mm -hmm. All of your inabilities are due to Adam. Your inability to perceive God is due to Adam. A feeling of alienation from God is due to Adam. All those kind of things. And brother, I thank God that Jesus came. Amen. I thank God that He did. Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. I don't want to dwell at all on that. Because I want to get right to the good stuff about the abundance of grace. But I do thank God that He does still. We still have the remnants of Adam with us. Because it helps us to run to our Savior. Amen. Amen. But Matthew chapter 4 and verse 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Now in the book of Romans, in that fifth chapter, you know what Jesus' one deed is. He told us, he says, The Father's given me a commandment to lay my life down and to take it up. And that is the gospel message. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's called in Romans 5, the obedience of the one. It's called the free gift. It's called the grace of God and the gift by grace. And the text is before me. It's the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. That as a saying by Adam, we received that which we would not. And by his sin... The whole human race was written off, weakness entered in, inability and all these other things. And so by the act of the other man, Jesus, now we're seeing the retrieval Amen. of glory and honor. Amen. And the crowning of man. Bring them back up in the region where they can reign. Amen. So I greet you as kings and priests because that is exactly what you are. Amen. Now we must give tribute to Jesus about this abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. John bore witness of him. Said of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace. Mm -hmm. I like the NIV. It says one blessing after another. I think that's very good. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now I know you brother never weary of hearing the gospel. So I'd like to give you a collage of scriptures. On what Christ has done. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. He hath made him to be sin. Who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God. In him. Amen. But he was wounded for our transgressions. And bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes. We are healed. He shall see the travail of his soul. And shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Amen. Galatians 1, 3, and 4. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God, and our Father. Ephesians 5, 25 and 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ has also loved the church, gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And we cannot end this collage in our tribute to Jesus Christ for what he's done without ending in Revelation 5, 9 to 12. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. So tonight, before we continue into this text, we must give tribute to our Savior who died, who was buried, and who has been raised. 
Amen. And who even at the present day intercedes for us in intensity. Amen. In Amen. Amen. We thank God for Him. Apart from Him, we would have, we would have no life. That's right. Now this uh, gift of righteousness, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, I want to say a few things about that. As we well know, it was the bent, and I speak as a man here, but our bent nature through Adam... Our desire for sin, wanting the things we ought not, and not wanting the things that we should, is actually what sent us into slavery. That's what sent us into slavery. Now, when you think of reigning, which is what our text says, in fact, let me read this for you real quick. Romans 5, 17, If by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. My contention is that it is unrighteous within us, unrighteousness, that made us slaves. How shall God make us to reign on the earth except to give us the gift of righteousness? <coughs> now there are some marvelous texts about this in Isaiah. Isaiah 32, 1-4. You know, our Lord has a scepter of righteousness. And that's the scepter by which we rule now. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. And princes, that's where you get in, shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, and as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerer shall be ready to speak plainly. Psalms 85 and 10 through 13 says, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Amen. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. I like this verse 13. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. Amen. Psalm chapter 89, verse 15 to 17. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. Amen. Isaiah 45, 8. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. And in the new covenant way of saying this, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Amen. Now the gift of righteousness that has come to us as a result of Christ's work, as I see it as a twofold work, it's of the death of Christ Jesus and it's of the living of Christ, the life of Christ Jesus. In Romans chapter 6 verses 8 through 11, it says, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over Him. For in that He died, He died unto sin. Once, but in that he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, though I would like to talk a lot about this, but just a few things about this gift of righteousness. I've said it's twofold. It's the dying of Christ Jesus. There are many things that are over in this category as far as we're concerned. We have experienced by faith forgiveness. Judicially, our sins have been separated from us, which is what death is. See, as far as east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. From the experience viewpoint, it is that our consciences have been cleansed. That enables us to come into the presence of God, that we're actually not conscionable about sins. That they don't smite us, that they've actually, experientially, we've actually received the cleansing of those things. That's death. Another thing about death, you may recall what Paul said. He said, I've been crucified to the world, and the world to me. This is a big part of reigning. And what I'm talking about is reigning in the earth right now. Eternal life, brethren, is not just the promise of something that's up ahead. Eternal life has already begun now. Yeah. It's already begun now. Yeah. And eternal life entails reigning with Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Retrieving the very image that He gave you from the very beginning. Glory and honor. And being able to, some degree, in certain measure, now being able to... To be righteous now. Yeah, See? Yeah, yeah. That's what eternal life is all about. And we've already, we've already begun that. So we have this death. This cutting away from the world. 
by faith, we really don't want it anymore. See, that's, that's, that's part of righteousness, see? Yes. Is we really don't want it. <laughs> that's part of death. Death involves the circumstances of Christ that is within you. The old man has actually been crucified. It's been cut away. It's been separated from you, see? It has. It no longer has control. See, it's the old man that sent us into slavery. And now he's on the cross. Amen. Now, it involves more than death. Our religion is it's more than death. It's about life, too. See? It's about living. Living unto God. The life of God. This involves the new birth that we've had. We've been born again. See? We receive a new nature that is created after the image of God. Amen. This is the part of you that knows and understands God. Can comprehend God. Mm -hmm. See? So that you can live before God. Mm -hmm. See? Amen. And both those things are involved in the gift of righteousness. And those are the things that enable us, enable us to reign in life. Now the gift of grace and the gift of righteousness are in fact a means to something. They are a means to reigning in life by one. And that's what eternal life is, as I've said, in its beginning stages. You must see this as a means to something. See? It's a means to fellowship with God. And that is what eternal life is, isn't it? John 17, 1 to 3. Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you gave him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I like the King James way of saying eternal life. Different places it used. Life everlasting. The emphasis, brethren, is not living on forever because everybody's going to live on somewhere, so to speak. The emphasis is, is in the fellowship that we have with God the Father and with His Son that through the image it is now culminated in our ability to understand God and know Him and be able to sense Him, to know it's the Lord and to have fellowship and interaction with Him. That's what eternal life is. And that's what it means to reign in life by one. See? This has got to be seen. You are, you are going to reign through your fellowship with Christ and God. It's no wonder that people are not victorious, so to speak, in their living before God because they are not constantly aware of the Lord. They don't live close enough to Him yes. to get the resources they need. Amen. Well, I thank God for this salvation because God. it doesn't allow for you to be victorious at a distance. Amen. You've got to press in to the Lord. Amen. And it is in that that we get everything we need for life and godliness. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 and 2, to give you a little more of the context. My verse is speaking, it's expounding on the atonement of Christ Jesus. That by one man, atonement has been made for sin. That the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness has come to us. But if you look up in the first couple of verses, it says this. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The context is our, our fellowship and presence with God now. That's the context of it. That the atonement, you see the atonement as a means to getting into God's presence and having access to God. Amen. And a little bit further down, in verse 10 and 11, it says, If when we're enemies, we're reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, through our fellowship with Christ and the Father, that's where you get everything you need to live godly Amen. in this Amen. life. Yes, For life and godliness. When we say life, we mean everything that pertains to spiritual life. When we say reigning in life by one, we're talking about spiritual life. The appointments that are necessary for you to stay alive in Christ. Amen. And all those appointments and all those needs you have, you receive when you're in fellowship with Christ. Amen. Amen. That's how it works. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you, Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 2 and 4. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and God, and it is through the knowledge of Him that have called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world. The idea, brothers, is, is that being a partaker of the divine nature is how you escape the corruption that is in the world. That's right. Now, grace is actually a means of retrieving the image of God supplanted in us and causing the virtues of being crowned with glory and honor to appear in their preliminary stages to the glory of God and His grace. Now, let's look at the intent of grace here, the reign in life by one. Say a few things about this. Now, think about how marvelous this is. Instead of saving you and then killing you so that you go to heaven immediately, here's how God shows His grace. That in the very same arena in which the devil took us captive and made us slaves, in that very same arena, now God's grace through one man is given to men, and now they are able to reign in the same arena they were slaves. <laughs> Isn't that good? They were able to be strong in the same arena the where they were weak. Amen. They were able to now be able in the same arena where they were unable. Amen. See? Amen. It's wonderful. And able to say yes to righteousness and no to ungodliness. Yes. It's a remarkable testimony to God's grace that I know it must frustrate the serpent. Yes. It must frustrate him. <coughs> now, it is the nature of grace, as I've said, to equip you. For many years, I, I kind of... I don't know if I just heard this or whatever, but the kind of notion I got about grace was just that it kind of just covered your weaknesses as a blanket. I didn't realize that it could equip you. But that's exactly what it does. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace. I, I want all grace about you. I want all grace. Make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. That sounds like a king to me. Doesn't that sound like a king to you? How remarkable it is. Now we do have kingly acts. That's what reigning in life is about. It's about we now have kingly acts. Let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Here's some words in the scripture that talk about something like this. Mortify. That's a kingly act. Set your affection. Be sober. Run with endurance. Lay hold. Fight the good fight. Reckon yourselves. Resist. It means being intentional. It means being purposeful. It means being effective. It means being aggressive. It means being able. It means having boldness. It means being fully assured. It means having confidence. It means being forceful. It means being temperate in all things. Amen. See, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about kingly, kingly acts that we can reign in life. By one Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, many different people in the, in the scriptures were known for certain attributes and characteristics of God's equipping. But Samson was known for God's strength. Abraham was known for faith. Some other places, different people known for different things. Paul was known for God's grace. You may recall uh, Paul's commission from the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 to 9, he says, I was, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. That's pretty good. <laughs> unto me, who am less than least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world have been hidden in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now that sounds like a pretty big task, doesn't it? To get the gospel out to Gentiles and to make them see. <laughs> that which has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Now let me tell you the truth. Salvation is just that hard. And harder. It is just as hard to get you from here to heaven as it is for that man to get the gospel of the Gentiles. See? And you may have noticed it wasn't like a convenient environment <laughs> that he was in. He recalled many different things that happened to him when he was preaching the gospel. He says five times he received forty stripes. Thrice he was beaten. With rods. Once he was stoned. Thrice he suffered shipwreck. A night and a day in the deep, you may recall. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And he said many more things. But this is what he's trying to tell you. God works salvation right in the middle of weakness. Amen. That's just the way God does it. Amen. Because when you're weak, that's when you're strong. Amen. And that's when grace moves you and not your own ability. 
Mm -hmm. And after all that Paul had done, and you know he was a fervent mm -hmm. worker, he worked, he was more abundant in his labors than the others. He said, by the grace of God I am, I am what I am, and so are you. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, that I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Amen. And the very grace of God that moved him to do what God commissioned him to do will move you to do what God commissions you to do for salvation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Kings and priests. Now there are three areas as I see it in which grace enables us to have these kingly acts as I call them. One is in denying. The other is in living. And the third is in looking. Titus chapter 2, 11 to 12 says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Denying, living, and looking. It actually flows quite well. Here we are denying. We're seeing the remnants of the old life going away. We're getting further away from the old life. And here we are living before God. In the expectation of the return of Christ Jesus. He's coming. See, we're moving toward a mark. That's what we're moving. Toward a mark. The grace of God is moving us in the progress of the direction of Christ's appearing. Now, the Thessalonians were known for this kind of an impact of grace. In denying and living and looking. Paul reported to them. It says, they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God for miles to serve the living and true God. See, turning, that's denying, for miles, to serve the true God, that's living, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come, that's looking. Now let's look at these three areas real quick. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust means ungodly is just things that are not like God. Ungodliness. Things that don't require God's presence, see, to be there. See, it can be more than just things you may typically think about. When you think of ungodliness, it goes beyond murder and some of these base things we know. But just things that don't require God. Ungodliness. We are to deny them. Worldly lusts. Are these very lusts that pull at us in our members, that wage war in our mind, that would draw us into the earth? Worldly lusts. And we are to deny them. See, the thing you want to see about grace is not only has it brought us into Christ Jesus, but it enables us to stay away from those things that would endanger the salvation which has already begun in us. Uh, you may recall Jesus uh, speaking the parable of the different seeds. And you may recall some of the seed fell among thorns. And as it grew up, the thorns actually choked out what had begun there. And he explained it and said, The ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. Now the truth of the matter is, you're not going to go to heaven if you don't deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. They have got to be denied. Don't forget Demas, who having loved this present evil world, forsook Paul. Grace enables us to operate in such a way as to deny the things that would kill our life in Christ Jesus. Grace enables you to reign over temptations. The temptations of what's called this vile body. And the tempter that provokes the lusts that are within us. So you want to see your body, brother, as like a mini kingdom. That's how you want to look at it. It really is that way. See your kings. One day you're going to rule over kingdoms. And now your body is your first kingdom to rule over. Sometimes it will lie low. And other times it will incite insurrection against the king. It can do that, as you know. It can do that. Like a rebel, the devil comes in and provokes your members to the world. And incites them against you. And you've got to be a king. See, your flesh is just like the devil is. He would lead you to believe that he's a king, even though nowhere in Scripture is he ever called a king. He is under supervision of the king of kings. Amen. But he comes in with an aggressive force and would, would, would seek to subvert you to do his will and to remind you of past sins and past failures and these kinds of things that kind of run rush out over you. 
And you have got to be a king Amen. and take a rule over that body and subject it. Amen. You may recall Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, I beat my body Amen. and make it my slave. Right. And that's what you want to do. Right. We have to beat our body. That's your kingly act. And I like this, the NIV on this in Titus 2.11 is really good. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and unworthy lust. To say no. Grace will enable you to do that. I want you to see how for just a moment. The way that grace does this is by establishing your heart. Where your heart is drawn up into heavenly places, see, that's, that's how grace will enable you to rule to rule over your own body. In fact, Hebrews 13, 9 tells us it's good for the heart to be established with grace. Yes. See? Not with foods and drinks, not with outward things, but by the strengthening of the heart. See, the heart is the seat of the affection of man. And when it's set toward God, it is able to deny ungodliness and worldly lust mm -hmm. and to subvert, to subvert the rest of the body to it. It says of uh, Moses, in Hebrews 11, 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Yes. It is as his, heart, as his heart was established toward heaven, and God became the all-consuming vision, the sanctified comparison told him, seeking God was the thing to do. Amen. And that's how it will help you, see? Amen. Eternal life is in your interplay and interaction with Christ and God. Is where you get the leverage over sin. Amen. And you know this is the case when he hides himself. <laughs> and when he when he obscures himself and how easy he can do this. And you fight and wrestle. Well, thank God for those high mountaintop experiences where you just you, there's like no temptation. See, that's the great thing about this new life. You actually have a party that does not want to sin. Amen. That's the truth. And see, as you strengthen that part, the new man, that's what enables you to, to in this kingly act, subvert, to subvert your body. It's important that we do that. We are to see the joy that is set before us. And in the, in the experience of that joy, you're able to say no, just like the Lord Jesus did. Amen. Now, grace doesn't only enable us to deny godliness and worldly lust, but it enables us to live before God. I like uh, the commas that are used here in this text in Titus 2, 12 and 13. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, and you get a comma, denying our God is more or less comma, we should live sober. It's almost like a, a parenthetical kind of thought there. If you took it out to say, teaching us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. See, some people's religion goes no further than just denying. But you see, denying is actually a means. Amen. It's a means to living. Amen. We get the distractions out of the way so that we can live before God. Amen. See? Amen. And that's what it's all about. Living before God. Amen. Jesus has already given us a head start on this. We talk about the grace of God that enables us to, to live righteously and godly in this present evil world. The Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. In order that we might know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true. Even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now to live soberly, righteously, and godly is in fact to live life conducted toward God. As you live toward the living God. That's what living godly is. You can actually, brethren, reign in your understanding of and fellowship with Christ. To really know the Lord. To know His ways. To know His will. To have confidence before Him. To walk close with Him. Brother, you don't have to leave it up to the theologians to be the experts in God. Because quite honestly, there may be a lot of them that aren't experts. Mm -hmm. You can be the theologians, so to speak. Enoch was known for walking with God, and why can't you? Why can't you be known for walking with God? You may recall the situation with Eli and Samuel. Samuel was a young man. God was just beginning to speak to this man. He was with Eli, and God called upon him. He didn't know who was calling him, so he went into Eli and said, here I am, did you call? No, I didn't call you. You go back to bed. We went back to bed, and this happened a few different times, and Eli finally figured out what is going on here. God's trying to call Sam. He said, go, go back and just lay down. See, when you hear this, you say, Lord, I'm, I'm listening. I'm, I'm listening. And he gave him a prophecy. And I may recall when he brought that prophecy back into Eli. Eli didn't hear the prophecy. Samuel heard it. He brought it back in and told him. 
And Samuel said, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. Now, brother, I'm here to tell you, you can be an Eli. You can. You can know it's the Lord. You can sense His presence in His ways and when He's doing things. See, you can perceive it and know it. To live before God. To live in the awareness of God in your daily life. You can do that. You can understand you can understand the Lord. I like this situation with uh, John the Beloved. If you recall, he was very close to the Lord. The disciple in whom Jesus loved. And you may recall, after Jesus had been resurrected, you may recall they went out fishing. It was, it was very dark still. It was very early in the morning. And they hadn't caught anything. Jesus was on the shore. And he called out to them, Children, have you caught anything? He said, No, we haven't caught anything. He said, Throw your nets on the right side, and I, me thinks that John's wheels began to turn real quickly. <laughs> Being sent to the Lord, he says, it's the Lord. <laughs> Peter threw a coat in and swam in. Now, this is what I'm telling you. You don't have to be Peter. I'm not denigrating Peter, but you can be a John. You can sense God's moving before other people do. See? You've got to know that here John <laughs> Living before God and having His Word in His mind, he was always trafficking in the things of God. So it wasn't awkward when he heard, throw your nets on the right side. And he recalled way back when they were commissioned into the ministry and the same kind of event happened. Amen. You can know the Lord too. Amen. Romans chapter 6, verses 10 and 11 says about Jesus, in that He died, He died unto sin once. In that He lives, He lives unto God. Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Truly, the only reason Jesus was resurrected was to do the will of God and to live before Him. And that's the reason you've been resurrected. Amen. It's to do the same yeah. thing. To live before God. Now, I, I want to touch on something that Brother Aaron's going to speak more on, so I'm not going to say a lot about it. But uh, being in Christ... As we know, that's more than just a theological position. It actually depicts a spiritual reality, an experience on the spiritual planes of being in Christ. It's like an environment that we're in. We've been seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, Amen. by faith, we're actually in an environment where we're in Christ, Amen. in heavenly places. And brethren, the truth of the matter is, if you're in Christ, you've got to know this. All the wisdom of God is in Christ too. Amen. Now, if you're in Christ, that means you have at your spiritual fingertips a faith, so to speak, all the wisdom that God has to offer. See? That's what you have. And Paul said to this to the Colossians, in Colossians 2, he was praying for them that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. <laughs> it's all at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. See? It's remarkable. 2 Peter 3.18 says, Grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now here's where your kingly act comes in. This doesn't just happen automatically. You're not going to automatically come to an understanding of God inadvertently while you're involved in other activities. That's right. Amen. See, you have got to have your eyes and your heart fixed towards heaven. Amen. And it's in that fellowship where you have access to these treasures. See, yes. here's your kingly act. When you wake up each day, your act is to present yourselves to God. To do that. Amen. To give your heart unto Him. To give your mind unto Him. To use Him. To think on Him. See, and uh, Romans chapter six verse thirteen says, "Yield your neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God mm -hmm. as those that are alive from the dead. Your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That's what living before God means. In other words, you make yourselves available to God. See, you do that, and everything you do, you do it as unto the Lord in word and deed. See." You can say like David, I meditate on my law all day long. You do that. And it's in that fellowship where all these riches of understanding come to you. Amen. We can live before the living God. We can reign in that to really know the Lord. Uh, this last aspect I want to cover is to look. Grace does enable you to look for Christ's appearing. The truth of the matter is, Jesus gave a prophetic 
utterance that in the last days before he would be coming, that it would be a severely distracting situation for people. That people would actually be not, they would not be thinking of Christ. They would not be living in view of what is going to be the most cataclysmic event in this world that has ever been known. He said in Matthew 24, 38 and 39, As in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered in the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Grace enables you, brother, to get ready for that divine appointment. Amen. So everybody's got an appointment on their schedule. And that is the coming of Christ to stand at the judgment seat. And grace enables you to live in view of that appointment right now. Amen. Amen. And I don't see how people can actually live righteously without living in the imminency of Christ's return. Right. Because that is what being sober is. Being sober is living in view of God's appointments. Amen. See, Living in view of His appointments. Living in view of heaven rather than earth. Living in view of God's agenda rather than your own. See, Living in view of that. Yes. First Peter 1.13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Being sober means you can see to the end of these things. And that actually constrains your conversation now, the way, the way in which you walk. Grace will do that. And He is coming. Amen. He is coming. The more I walk with Christ and the closer I get to them, the more I sense when He says, Behold, I come quickly, like my heart is, yes, I, I can see that you definitely are. <laughs> At any moment. He's coming. Behold, He comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see Him, and they also which pierced Him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. Even so, amen. amen. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. He is coming. As lightning comes out of the east and shines into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now this is the thing about the word of grace that's remarkable. The word of grace has a powerful sanctifying element to it. That when it is kept in memory, it enables you to live sober. Yeah. See, that grace Amen. is actually imparted when you pay attention to the word of grace that enables you to look to His coming and to live daily in view of it. Acts chapter 20, verses 32, Paul said it this way, Now, brethren, I commend you to God, to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance amongst all them which are sanctified. Mm -hmm. It's no wonder we always preach the gospel, because it's in the declaration of the gospel that the climactic portion of the gospel is made known to the hearts of men that He is come. That He is come. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Looking is in fact living in the expectancy of His return. Amen. To know that He shall indeed come quickly. To know what some of these passages of Scripture say, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. So you know that. You're persuaded. You're persuaded of it. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. That's living sober. The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And this is in fact the hope that saves. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Amen. Amen. What a truth. Now the glorious consummation of reigning in life by one Jesus is being able to stand when He appears. Yes. It's one thing to promote confidence right now. It's another thing to be confident before Him when He actually appears. Yeah. Now here's the end result of this reign in life. First of all, our reign enables us to deny ungodliness of worldly lust. You've got to believe that. Even when it doesn't appear that way. When you're down in the valleys, or when you're having a hard time with the pulling of sin, you've got to believe you are king. You are. And you must see the value of grace to enable you to have a kingly act of subverting your flesh. And you can do it. 
by the grace of God. Amen. And that you can not only deny, but that you can live before God in the awareness of God. <laughs> to have eternal, that's what eternal life is, to have that now. To be in fellowship with Christ. To read the Bible and know what it's saying. To be able to joy in God, as the scripture says. See, to exult in hope of the glory of God. And finally, to reign and know that He is in fact coming. That when Jesus comes, you won't be surprised. Amen. That when He comes, you'll actually say, this, this is our God. Amen. And we have waited for Him. Amen. Day in and day out, and moment, moment by moment. Jude chapter 1 verses 24 to 25 says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Amen. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Now for this time, our, our, our king status, so to speak, has been hidden. But in the day of his appearing, our reign will consummate in being able to stand before him with confidence. Amen. See? Amen. And if you are as he is now in the world, you will have the confidence then. You live before God right now, Amen. you'll have it then. Amen. See, there are two pictures of his coming which are so diametrically opposed. One shall be them that shall call for rocks and mountains to fall on them. And the other is them that shall admire him Amen. at his coming. Amen. Grace will enable you to admire him <coughs> when he comes. This is my final exhortation to you about God's grace. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. It says, The God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after this you've suffered a while, it's, it's only a while, mm -hmm. make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever.